sheet. That's when you have sheet right. Um, so I don't know. Look at that. Right, just have, you know, the side. Thank you again for inviting me. I wanted to start today by just uh, offering a word of condolence to Nathan Acker. He was one who contacted me a few years ago to invite me to address this assembly. And it's been one of the highlights of my year. It's always a pleasure to be here. And thank you for being optimistic enough to keep inviting me back. Now, I wanted to talk today about looking at the night sky. Because many people have mentioned to me how sad it is that we've lost the mythology. If you look up in the night sky <coughs> tonight, you'll see Orion confronting Taurus the bull in pursuit of the seven sisters. You will see him being followed by his hunting dogs. You will see the Gemini twins, the brothers of Helena Troy. All of these characters adorning the firmament. <laughs> and they say, well, they don't exist anymore. We now know them to be just fictional constructs. And the stars that are just, most of the time, chance arrangements of distant spheres. And isn't it unfortunate, especially for those who've read Edith Hamilton's mythology, isn't it unfortunate that the night sky is no longer peopled by these superhuman characters? And in a way it is, but the trade-off has been immense, and that's the topic of today. Because now, when we observe our night sky, we're looking at a minuscule part of a universe that is so prodigiously creative and dynamically energetic that only now, after centuries of assiduous effort, are astronomers really able to start to fathom all that exists in our universe. I want to give you an idea. Tonight, the sun sets, around, I'm on camera, I better get this right. The sun <laughs> sets around 4.33, 4.34. Don't despair, it's going to get later and later. Until it's fine. You go out tonight around 6 o'clock in the evening. I'll make it very easy for you. We don't have a dome here. I generally speak to people in a dome where I have the stars available to me, readily accessible. Tonight, go out around 6 o'clock, look right up, you'll see Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia looks like a W in the stars. Very easy to find. You look right up at Cassiopeia, go right behind her, and you'll see the North Star. Okay, that's very simple. Cassiopeia <laughs> is mired in the light of the Milky Way. Now, that statement is very confusing for a lot of people, understandably. How can we live in the Milky Way galaxy while still being able to see it in the night sky? <clears throat> well, I I'll clarify this for you. First of all, we see part of our home galaxy in the night sky. It looks like a ring of light that extends between the eastern and the western horizons early this evening. And Cassiopeia is mired in its light. We live in the Orion Cygnus arm of the Milky Way galaxy. Our galaxy, if seen from the outside, which we're not going to be able to do for quite a long time, looks like a hurricane of stars, about 300 billion of them. Now, you can be forgiven for not being able to comprehend the number billion. Nobody can comprehend the number billion. Stephen Hawking couldn't do it. Carl Sagan spoke about it, but he couldn't do it. Nobody can really grasp what it means to have a number of that size. I want to give you an idea. Imagine you go out tonight. Is it going to be clear tonight? I'm not a meteorologist. I don't have to know that. I mean, hopefully it will be. You go out tonight, you count all the stars visible to the unaided eye from dusk to dawn. You would count about 10,000 individual stars. Now, does it, anybody have a piece of paper? I should ask that beforehand. Just a blank piece? A blank piece of paper. This, I'm, make, I'm making life easy, very easy for you. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Now, imagine you were meticulously patient. You could draw 10,000 small black dots on a sheet of paper measuring eight and a half inches wide by probably a half of the Guinness this, this length, okay? So you could put 10,000 small black dots on a sheet of paper about this size, okay? Those small black dots would represent all the stars visible over the course, to your unaided eye, over the course of one night. May I keep it? I might need it again. Now, 
in order to be able to draw all the dots to represent all the stars in the galaxy, you need a sheet of paper measuring eight and a half inches wide by 1,500 miles, <laughs> going from Portland, Maine, almost to Miami, Florida. So compare a sheet of dots you can hold like this to a column of dots extending down the entire eastern seaboard gives us an idea of how much of the galaxy we actually don't see when we look up in the night sky, even from the darkest areas of the world. Now, add to that the notion that there are many galaxies and universes or stars in the galaxy. And, moreover, astronomers who are searching for exoplanets, planets in orbit around other stars, are now convinced that there are probably three times as many planets as there are stars in our galaxy. There could be as many as one trillion planets wow. in the galaxy alone. Yeah. Well, to give you an idea of one trillion, one trillion seconds is about 32,000 years. Whoa. So that bodes well for those of us who want the galaxy to team with life. The greater the number of planets you have, the greater the probability that life will actually evolve in one of those planets. Now, this is more in chemistry, so I'm going to, I'm really out of my depth, yeah. but it seems as though the chemistry of life, chemistry works the same here as it does around the universe. It's called the fundamental theorem of physics. It applies to chemistry as well. We know that carbon bonds much more readily than other elements, and presumably the same processes involved in creating us are actually valid elsewhere in the universe. And we also know when life takes hold, it becomes very resilient. They have found life in glaciers. They have found life in volcanic vents. When life starts, it's very difficult to destroy. Life persists despite the adversities that beset it. So it really bodes well to know how resilient life is, how many planets there are, and the physics and the chemistry involved in the formation of those life forms is valid everywhere. So when we look up in the night sky, we realize we're looking at a very tiny part of an immense universe. Not only is it immense, it's also, as I said, prodigiously creative. According to estimates, 20 to 35,000 stars are born in the universe every single second. That's, now, that's a lot. Now, of course, the universe is a very big place. The universe, these stars are being born throughout all the different galaxies. In our galaxy alone, we have one star born every 11 to 18 days. And so you add, so again, that's adding. So you just do the math, crunch numbers, you realize how much is being created, how much exists out there. Now, how far have we gone? Well, if I may ask, who remembers the moon landings? <laughs> late 60s, early 70s. I don't. Um, but, but here's the thing. That's as far as humans have gone. We've gone about a quarter of a million miles away from Earth. Now I want to keep it in terms of light. I was going to bring my laser pointer, but I didn't. Under the, under the podium. Really? Yep. By the, the, it looks like a pen. There oh, wonderful. There we go. I'm not going to shine this in your eyes. Okay. Let's all pretend. Everybody, can everybody see this light beam? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. You turn the light off behind you if Jeff doesn't mind. Oh, not at all. Okay. If you want to. Yeah. All right. Now, imagine that beam were strong enough. It seems like it is, but it isn't. That beam could get to the moon in 1.2 seconds. In one minute, that light beam traveling to a vacuum would be 11 million miles away. And now let's imagine also, to give you another idea, Imagine we go to the equator, which would be absolutely lovely right now. Thank you very much. Okay, You go to the equator, you fire this laser beam, okay, and you jump out of the way. Because this laser beam is so strong, it's going to circumnavigate the globe, okay, and you don't want it to go through you. Well, you fire it, you jump out of the way, and in one second it takes you to get out of the way, it's going to wrap you through you seven, and a, seven times. That's how fast light travels. Light travels very quickly. Now the distances, let me bring this back up. Now the distances... Okay. In the universe are so vast, we don't use miles. We can if we want to, if you want numbers written like this. We use the term light year. Light year is merely the distance that light travels in one year. About 186,290 miles per second, or about 6 trillion miles a year. Now, that's how, now, the closest star to us, anybody know the name of the closest star to us? 
the sun. Now, the sun is about 8.4 light minutes away. Whenever you look at the sun, which is never a good idea, assuming we'll see it again, okay, you're seeing the sun as it was 8.4 minutes before. The closest star system to the sun is called Alpha Centauri. It's about 4.4 light years away. You really <coughs> have to be south of mid-Florida, okay, another wonderful thought, okay, in order to see Alpha Centauri. Best to be seen in the southern hemisphere, best to see it around the Antarctic Circle, where it's almost high overhead. By the way, you may have heard of the Southern Cross, if you ever go to see Alpha Centauri, you see Alpha Centauri, do this here, you see Alpha Centauri, Beta Centauri, and then Crux. Alpha, Beta, Crux. The Southern Cross's name is Crux. A, Alpha, Beta, C. Well, that's 4.4 light years away. Now, if you don't mind, we're going to try an experiment. It requires you to do nothing at all except have a moment of silence. So what we're going to do, we're going to have a very brief moment of silence now. It's easy as that. Now, when we had our moment of silence, Light left the three stars <coughs> comprising Alpha Centauri. That's a three-star system. <coughs> and it's 4.4 light years away. The light that left those stars when we had our moment of silence is already about 2 million miles away from the stars that they left. Hmm. And a little bit of that light is going to reach Earth. Now, right now, that light is traveling toward us, okay? At 186,290 miles per second. That light will arrive at mid-April of 2020. Wow. So, yes. just think I, I about the light wow. when we had our moment of silence. That light is still going toward us, and it's going to take all that time to get to us. And that's the closest star system to our solar system. Mm -hmm. So, comparing the difference between 8 minutes and 4.4 .4 years <laughs> gives us an idea of how much space separates the stars. Wow. And how far away have we gone? Quarter of a million, 1.2 light seconds away. Now, how about our robot probes? Our robot probes have gone farther. In fact, they just had the New Horizons that went by Ultima Thule, this body in the Kuiper belt. That's still less than one light day away. And the Voyager probes that were launched in the 70s that have gone by the giant planets, the Pioneer probes, those probes are going to go through space for millions or billions of years. Those are like ships in a bottle. Now people ask a very good question, okay? What's keep why do they keep going? Okay? Which is really which is actually very sensible. You know, here on Earth, we have to push our accelerators, okay, we have to keep moving to overcome the frictional forces that are impeding our travel. There, Newton's law. It's moving at a constant velocity, as long as no force acts on it, it will continue to go. Those Voyager probes that were launched in the 70s will continue to go at more than 30,000 miles an hour for millions of years. And provided they don't hit anything, considering there's a lot of space in space, uh, they, they won't have any decay, they won't have any corrosion, they won't have any impediment. They'll continue to go. Those probes will take tens of thousands of years to even get within a few light years of the closest stars. And those are going very, very quickly. So what astronomy has told us, not only has it demonstrated that our universe is wildly creative, unfathomably large, and populated with all manner of planets and stars and nebulae and galaxies, it's shown us that we're really homebodies. <coughs> we really stay. We're really here on Earth, and we don't really see, even the International Space Station right now is about 250 miles above our surface. Fred Hoyle, one of the most preeminent astronomers in human history, actually said, outer space isn't that far away, so now we're driving going this way. Okay. Outer space, called the Kármán line, is about 62 miles up. So by the aerodynamics, by what, what it would take to fly a plane in a spacecraft, we're about uh, 60 miles away from the level of the atmosphere called outer space. And so astronomy has been called the study of the universe beyond Earth's atmosphere, which isn't a great definition because Earth's atmosphere, exosphere, goes hundreds of miles up and outer space starts about 62 miles away. But what's remarkable, what's miraculous, is that the assiduous efforts of astronomers working in collaboration all around the world, even today, have managed to fathom what they fathomed about our cosmos. We know that there are billions of stars. We know that there are probably billions of planets. They've found about 3,500 so far 
That, that number will change tomorrow. They know that they found out these galaxies. A hundred years ago, which is 2019, a hundred years ago, they didn't even know if there were other galaxies beyond their own Milky Way. There was a, a little bit less than a hundred years ago, there was a famous uh, debate between Harlow Shapley and Heber Curtis about whether the nebulae seen, out, seen in space, like the Andromeda Nebulae, were actually other galaxies or swirls of vapor amongst the stars. Now, Harlow Shapley, the more preeminent of the two, argued that it, they were not galaxies. He was wrong, but uh, he was probably never so happy to be wrong. <laughs> but he, so a hundred years ago, the notion of other galaxies really was a matter of dispute. Now, it's one of the fundamental facts of astronomy. We are immensely small, and we live in an enormous universe that we can't even fathom. I mean, it's hard enough to think about going a million miles let alone going billions of light years. Now, as far as, the, now, as far as the most distant object we can see in the unaided eye, we talk about going to the night sky. We go out tonight, we look up at Cassiopeia, directly over our heads. If you look over in to the, boom, da, 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 da. can you tell I work in a dome all the time? Over here, and then you go over here to the, about here. You can see the Andromeda galaxy. It looks like a patch of light. It's 2.2 million light years away. It's about the size of eight full moons side by side, but it's not nearly that bright. And so it looks like a splotch of light. Again, 2.2 million light years away. And it contains about 500 billion stars. Now the other aspect of astronomy that gives us pause, not only has it introduced us to the concept of enormous space, it's also given us the notion of inconceivable spans of time. <clears throat> and what we can know about what will transpire far in the future. Again, we don't know what's going to happen in our society a year from now. But we know that about four to six billion years from now, that splash of light called the Andromeda Galaxy is going to merge with the Milky Way. Our galaxy and the Andromeda Galaxy in billions of years are going to merge together to form a super galaxy. Now, they do computer models to show what happens, and they see different galaxies in the universe in different stages. The galaxies don't just mesh together, they move toward each other, the gravity accelerating them to great velocities. And then the gravitational attraction <laughs> causes them to impede their motions, and it's this beautiful, almost elegant pure way of two galaxies merging together. But in the process of that happening, Millions of stars are shot out into intergalactic space. Right now, they think that there are quite a few stars traveling through the, the large scale of space between galaxies. Now, it could be possible you could have life on planets in the middle of different galaxies. And people, people think that doesn't make any sense. How can a star that isolated from anything else support life? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're isolated ourselves. I mean, we're, we're around a star but there's hundreds of light years of space cubic volume that separates us from the nearest star. So, not only are there stars in galaxies, there are stars between galaxies, probably planets between galaxies, probably planets shot away from stars between <coughs> galaxies. Okay? They find them somewhat times by noticing the way that they bend light, because gravity, that's another thing. More than 100 years ago, Albert Einstein, you probably heard of the name, uh, <laughs> developed his theory of general relativity. Okay. The math is from the devil himself, but the concepts, you know, the, the concepts, okay, actually are really interesting when you think about it. Because we think of gravity, Isaac Newton, perhaps regarded as one of the greatest scientists of all time, regarded gravity as the, you know, the force exerted between two objects, okay? Isaac Newton said gravity was not a force, but just a result of the geometry of space-time. Right now, we're sitting here in this beautiful, establishment because we're caught in Earth's space-time well, okay? And Earth, we're having these seasons, six months from now it's going to be much warmer because Earth is trapped in the sun's gravity well. And that's how we think about gravity. Now gravity, not only does it attract matter, it can bend light. They, they determined that in 1919 when they studied the star field behind a solar eclipse visible from South America and Africa. And that showed, that gave real evidence. Sir Arthur Eddington, his expedition really gave credence to Albert Einstein's notion 
that gravity bends light. Not only does gravity bend light, gravity also changes time. That's the other thing astronomy has done. It's given us great space. It's given us inconceivable durations of time, but then it showed that time itself is malleable, which is a very difficult thing to comprehend, to be honest, because we like to think we're all Newtonians at heart. We, one second, one second, one second, one second. Maybe that's feeling like a lot more than one second, one second to you guys right now, but time goes by in a smooth flow. But if you move quickly, it doesn't. It's called special relativity. And if you move, let's just say, for the purposes of experiment, that, I was about to say our planetarium, but I'm not a planetarium right now, right? Let's just say that this beautiful room goes at about 86.6% the speed of light through space, okay? And how long, would you, how long would you like to spend in my company? One year? Two years? You, 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 you can lie right now to make this work. <laughs> how much time? Maybe, let's just say we want to spend a year together. So we go at 86.6% the speed of light, we travel through space, come back here, and we say, well, that was the best year of my life, listening to that gentleman talking, talking, talking. <laughs> what happens is, you get out, two years have gone by on Earth. Now, I really, really made sure my net math was right about this, because I 86.6% of the speed of light, right? So, what happens is, it's called time dilation. The faster you move, okay, the more time dilates. So now, it didn't just feel like a year to us, okay? It was a year to us. We move that quickly, we come back. Two years have elapsed on Earth, okay? Time dilates, time changes. Newtonian time was comfortably intuitive. You had space and time disparate, okay? Not related to one another. Albert Einstein gave us space-time. So not only has astronomy given us enormous amounts of space, an immense amount of stars, lots of planets, it's also given us a notion that even the most apparently insubstantial aspects of our physical reality can be changed by what happens in reality. Now, not only that, there is general relativity. Special relativity had to deal with light, that was 1905. Special, general relativity was gravity, 1916. Now, there's something called gravitational time dilation. We're experiencing different times of time than people in Colorado, okay? Because they're at a different altitude. In fact, there are atomic clocks. They used to say that the one second of one over 86,400 thousandths of a day. That was a beautiful, nice, comfortable. Now it's all based upon the cesium atom, and it's a number that I, I can never remember. But it, they, they time it very, very precisely. And clocks in Colorado Springs, and clocks at the Greenwich Royal Observatory in England, have to be calibrated to take into account that the one in the Greenwich Royal Observatory is closer to Earth's core. Higher gravity is accelerating, time is different. Now, you can take this, and we're going to put it in an extreme example. Okay? Who wants to jump into a black hole? Anybody. You, listen, if you can survive a year listening to me talk, you can survive a year. Now, here's the thing. We're going to, put you, we're going to throw somebody into a black hole. And what happens is, now ordinarily, if you go through a regular black hole, okay, a black hole, by the way, let's reverse for a second. A black hole is a region of space-time where gravity is immensely, very immensely powerful. So powerful, in fact, that nothing can escape from it. Now, people ask a very good question. They understand if you have a body, okay, like a planet or a star, if you add mass to it, okay, then its gravity increases. But what is not quite as obvious is why does gravity increase if you shrink it down? I'll explain it this way. We're standing here, um, uh, feel free to answer any way you want to. Are we experiencing gravity, the gravitational push, from the ground beneath our feet? Yes. Because gravity, every massive object is attracting you gravitationally. Okay. 
No matter how you behave, it's attracting you gravitationally. Now, how about Earth's core? Is Earth's core pulling on us gravitationally? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. It's farther away. As it turns out, the, the universal law of gravitation says that the gravitational attraction exerted between any two objects is, this is a wonderful phrase to say if you want a conversation starter <laughs> in a quiet room and no one's talking, you can stand up and you can say, the gravitational attraction exerted between any two massive objects is directly proportional to the masses of both and inversely proportional <laughs> to the square of their separation okay. distance. Yeah, okay. Well, okay. Well, 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 well. <laughs> now, Did you understand it? I'll tell you what that means. That means, let's just say I have two asteroids or two bowling balls, whatever it is. If I, keep the, if I increase their masses, okay, if I double their masses, the force between them becomes more powerful. But if I double their distance, the gravitational force between them is reduced to one-fourth of their original value, the square of the distance. So if I triple their distance, it's one-ninth. If I quadruple their distance, I, that's as far as I can go. Okay, it's one sixteenth, and so forth and so on. What that means, what that translates into is the farther away you are from a gravitational body, the weaker its gravitational force on you becomes. Now, the Andromeda galaxy, which you mentioned before, is much more massive than Earth, but it's much farther away. That's why we walk outside, we don't start floating toward the Andromeda galaxy, because Earth <laughs> is overpowering it by virtue of its proximity to us. So, so now, we know that every massive object attracts you gravitationally. And we notice that the magnitude of that gravitational attraction is reduced the farther away it is. We'll start again. Is the ground beneath our feet attracting us gravitationally? Yes. Yeah. Is Earth's core yes. attracting us gravitationally? Yeah. Are the mountains of New Zealand attracting us gravitationally? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Now, not as much, but what happens if we take Earth and shrink it? If we squeeze it down? What happens? Suddenly, we're closer to the Earth's core. We're closer to the mountains of New Zealand. We're closer to every single particle comprising our planet. Well, let's keep shrinking this down more and more and more. What happens? Suddenly, we're closer to absolutely every particle comprising Earth. Now, that's what determines what we call our escape velocity. If I could throw this laser pointer, okay, at seven miles per second, no, eleven miles per second, I could escape Earth's gravity. The Saturn V rocket that sent the uh, Apollo astronauts to the moon had to attain that velocity to escape from Earth's gravitational field to get them to the moon. Well, how many people think that I can throw this at 11 miles per second? How many people really don't want me to try? Okay, no. <laughs> here's the thing. If you start to shrink Earth down to a smaller and smaller volume, then the uh, velocity you need to attain to escape Earth's gravitational field becomes larger and larger. Well, eventually, you can get to the point where the escape velocity <coughs> equals the speed of light. And in order for Earth's gravitational field to be powerful enough to have its escape velocity be the speed of light, the entire Earth, the entire molten core, the Earth's core, the mountains, the cities, the continents, would have to be the size of a marble. Like this. Okay. That's how powerful Earth would have to be. That's how small Earth would have to be. And I mean, that's just not part of Earth. That's everything. That's absolutely, positively everything on Earth. All the mountains, all the cities, the molten iron core, everything would have to be reduced down to this volume. Now, a couple of things, a couple of tangential notes we can draw about this. One, matter is mostly empty space. That's the other thing that's remarkable, we have found out through science. We're almost all nothing. Okay. Now, don't, don't, don't take that personally. Okay. Okay. But, just, but just in a material way, the amount of actual volume occupied by the, at, by the neutrons and the protons in our atoms, I mean, that's, it's very, very small, okay, like a marble in a stadium, essentially. That's, that's how small the atoms are. So if you reduced all that space, suddenly you have a very, very small object. So, a black hole is something in which it is pushed down so tightly, so compactly, that nothing can escape from it, not even light. And the only mechanism we know that can do this 
is a massive star. And when a massive star explodes, now why do massive stars do that? Well, right now, there are two forces that are acting against each other, okay? We're, 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 we're Americans, we know American politics, we know about two forces acting against each other. Well, in this case, it's actually doing something constructive. In the sun, you have energy pressure pushing out and gravity pushing in. Gravity is always, always, always attractive, okay? The gravity of the sun is <coughs> pushing in, and the energy pressure is pushing out. And the counterbalance of those two antagonistic forces gives us a state of hydrostatic equilibrium. The sun is stable. Now, that's good, because right now, the sun is producing energy. That's the other thing that astronomy has done for us, just on a tangential note. It's given us something less to worry about. Because we know, based upon this, the theory of stellar nucleosynthesis and nucle thermal nuclear fusion, we know that right now in the sun's core, hydrogen is being converted into helium. 670 million tons of it every single second. And a few million tons are converted right into energy. Who's ever seen the E equals mc squared equation? Probably the most famous equation in physics, maybe apart from m equals fa. E equals mc squared means that energy and mass are related. m is mass, c is the speed of light squared, or c multiplied by itself. So if I were really clever, I'm not, <laughs> if I could convert all the material in this laser pointer into energy, I could probably power Manhattan Island for three months. Because matter is crystallized energy. That's one of the profound implications of the special theory of relativity. I can't do it, okay? Now, that's what the sun is doing, by the way. And the sun is doing that every single second of every single day. Astronomy has shown us that the sun has enough material to sustain those reactions for the next few billion years. Okay? Now, I don't know, not having been around in the 14th, 15th, 16th century, I don't know how much time people spent looking up at the sun worrying about how long it would persist. I do know, of course, that a couple thousand years ago, it was an issue of such importance that people would conduct these elaborate rituals in order to coax the sun back up to a higher altitude. That, that, that caused a lot of concern. We've noticed now, we see it now in our reduced daylight. In the uh, first day of summer, at this out, out latitude, the sun at noontime is about 70.5 degrees above the southern horizon. On the winter solstice, it's about 23 and a half. Okay? That's scary. Now, I give my students a question. Why well, I, I give them a homework assignment. When you leave, give me the money you were going to give your landlord for rent or your bank for the mortgage. And I hold out my hand. Guess how much money I have made doing that. <laughs> <laughs> now, I say, when well, then I ask, well, what's the problem? Because you say, uh, I'm a planetarium astronomer, so I'm, I'm just made of money. So what I didn't tell you is I paid your rent for five years. Okay? What I didn't tell you is I paid off your mortgage. Okay? And I, the, the, my illustration is, why wouldn't you give me the money you have allotted to uh, pay for your apartment or your house. Because if you don't give money, that money to the appropriate person, you'll lose your livelihood. Okay? You don't know that I paid off your mortgage. You don't know that I paid off your rent. Okay? All you know is that you have to give this money each month in order to stay where you are. Well, imagine the risk <coughs> the ancient people a couple thousand years ago would have assumed if they said, well, we're not going to bother with the ritual this year. Okay? We know that the sun goes from one altitude to another simply because we're on a planet that's tilted in space and going around. They wouldn't have done it. The people, people, the reason, reason I mention that is because people sort of look at cu with curiosity at an ancient people who would take that much time to coax the sun back up to a higher altitude when those fools didn't realize what was actually going on. There's no way they could have. And they knew that the sun was immensely important. They knew the sun was vital to their lives. And so performing the ritual, as had been performed for years and years and years and years, needed to happen. If they had foregone it, if they had neglected it, the sun might have gone down below the horizon forever, steeping them in darkness. So we now know astronomy has said, don't worry. We know why the sun goes to different altitudes because of the 
one soul system the other because it's a beautiful world tilted. By the way, we're in a speeding bullet. That's another thing: space and time and uh, immensity and speed. We're going. We're going at sixty-seven thousand miles an hour around Earth, around the Sun. No, I almost said around Earth. A little geocentric moment. Okay. Now, here's the funny thing. So we know we're going quickly. We know that the Sun's altitude is related to our tilt, and we know that the Sun is producing energy in such copious quantities and has so much fuel available to it that it's going to continue to give us energy for billions of years. By the way, for those people who really love to worry about things they can't control, okay, <laughs> Patriots fans, okay, <laughs> notice that about 1.1 billion years from now, Earth is probably going to be too hot to sustain life. It's a beautiful thought right now, isn't it? But because the sun is getting larger, it's getting more and more luminous, producing more and more energy. Mm -hmm. So right now we know that the sun has enough hydrogen to continue those reactions for the next five billion years. We know that Earth will be too hot to sustain life by 1.1 billion years from now. We'll, we'll, we'll make other arrangements at that point, I think. So anyway, to go back to the original point, so you have this energy pressure pushing out, you have the gravity pushing in. But if you have a highly massive star, much more massive than the sun, the sun will never do this, what happens is the hydrogen converts into helium, the helium converts into carbon, the carbon into oxygen, all the way up to iron. Okay, now, that's the other thing the astronomy has given us. Space, and time, and immensity, and stars, and it's given us a notion of our origins that is startling. Because all the elements creating our body, the oxygen we're breathing, the carbon in our skin, the iron in our blood, was all produced when a massive star exploded. Because when you have these elements created in these heavy stars, okay, once it reaches iron or nickel, it becomes an endothermic process. The amount of energy the star needs to impart into the core is greater than the energy it gives back to the star. Okay? And suddenly there's a disruption of that hydrostatic equilibrium, the gravity pushing in and the energy pushing out. It explodes. The layers fall down at half the speed of light. It explodes as a supernova. And that supernova explosion produces all the elements heavier than iron and distributes them through the galaxy, enriching it chemically. And in fact, that's why we're here. Because six billion years ago, a star exploded, and the particles, the heavy elements, scattered through space and enriched it. Now they call them metals. This is where chemistry and astronomy bang heads. Okay? Because chemists would be a scandalized to realize that we call everything heavier than helium a metal. Okay, there are specific metals, I'm sorry, Victor, there, there are specific metals, but to uh, to the astronomer, metals are anything heavier than helium. Because that's what you need to to create all those stars. All all the elements are what we need to create us. So we're here because a star exploded and created the sun and its attendant planets in over four billion years. Huh. Here we are. Now. I'm exhausted. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's our fault. So, so it's given us, so we are literally, we are literally stardust. We are literally amalgams of the universe that somehow developed the ability to be introspective, to examine itself. Now, I'll tell you this. I know I'm on camera. I know I work for a university, at least today. I'm a very spiritual person. That's one thing that because people, when they listen to me say this, when they listen to this, it's like, well, there goes everything else. There goes the non-material. I'm a very spiritual person. I think that every time we have tried to impose limitations in the universe, the universe has confounded us. Thirty years ago, people wondering if there were planets on other stars. <laughs> there are billions. A okay? hundred years ago, people were wondering if there are actually galaxies beyond the Milky Way. There are billions. People right now are saying, what if there's a life elsewhere in the universe? <laughs> They're probably all laughing at us. Well, wait for these people to evolve another hundred years, two hundred years, then they'll then they'll we'll we'll join the whatever gathering 
<laughs> that's been going on all around us. So, but that's okay. This is not meant, I'm not just saying this because I'm in a church, I'm saying this because it's part of the human condition. This is not meant as a counteraction or a contradistinction of spirituality. I almost think it's a verification, affirmation of it. Because we live in an absolute miracle. Every single second. When we're here for a microsecond, we're, we're here, we have this great blue flame soul in this body on this four billion year old planet that's tucked away in a universe we've only started to really understand. And yet here we are talking about it, here we are with minds that can play chess and draw circles and write poetry all in the same afternoon. And the consciousness still confounds the evolutionists, okay? The actual origin of our universe still confounds cosmologists. But one thing that we know of is that we're here. <clears throat> and we are fully alive in a beautiful, dynamic, prodigiously creative universe. So perhaps the study of astronomy is one of the most spiritual activities in which we can engage. Because we're studying the universe and in so doing, we're studying ourselves. Thank you very much for listening. Nice. Nice.